I was hoping she was going to turn that down because I'm like, I don't think I can bust out any dance moves. <laughs> like, what am I going to do? Just stand here. No. Um, it is a privilege for me to introduce our Real People, Real Jesus speaker for today. And I was thinking about how long I have known Ed specifically, but Ed and Tony. And it is well over 20 years. And um, <laughs> this story came to mind when Hunter was really little, he had a super picky diet. It was pretty much raw vegetables and fruits, which is, you know, great. But we were at a church function, and he had a plate of blueberries. And Ed kept stealing Hunter's blueberries. And Hunter would laugh about it, and he'd eat it and pop it in his mouth, and Hunter would wonder where it went. And so he started to call Ed Mr. Blueberry. And um, he called Gene Huntley drums, because he always played the drums. But Ed was Mr. Blueberry. And uh, probably about six to eight years ago, I can't remember now, Ed completely remodeled our kitchen. And it's beautiful. Um, but before he tore down the wall, the kids all wrote him messages. So that when he came into our house, he would see these messages of appreciation from our family. And I have a picture, and I wish I would have huh, thought to put it up, but I have a picture of Hunter who looks like he's in about eighth grade, and he's writing to Mr. Blueberry, thanking him. And so, you know, Ed is definitely a guy that makes a positive impression and a lasting impression. And I could say a lot about the things that he's talented at, but one thing I know for sure is how much he loves Jesus. And I am very thankful that we get to hear about that today. So please welcome Ed. Thanks, Rachel. I didn't even have to pay her to say that. How's everybody today? Good. Well, we're just going to sit down and have a little fireside chat, even though the fire's not going. Okay. Um, first, um, a little disclaimer, a little start here. Um, to maybe our young guys, young kids. What do you want me to do? <laughs> Except I want to talk to the younger guys first. You know, this is my show. <laughs> you don't see Johnny Carson's producer saying sit somewhere else. <laughs> okay, so for our young ones, first I want to say... You may have heard the, term, the saying, all your actions have a consequence. Maybe from a parent or a grandparent. Well, I'm here to tell you, there's nothing but truth to that statement. Okay? And then for you, as well as all of our adults, because we, we deal with this all the time, we all get to a point, or it's at some level, we get to a point where we feel we're in a hole. We are at our lowest. We may not even feel we can see the light of day. Well, think about yourself in a hole. What, what, you're not sitting in that hole looking at your feet, are you? No, you're looking up. You're looking up to try to figure out how to get out of this hole. Well, let me tell you something. You're looking up. You're looking up to Jesus. Okay? Okay. When you're at your lowest, that's when God can work his best. So you're never too low. All right? So I was asked to talk about a guy who I'm very familiar with. Matter of fact, let's put a picture of him up here. You got that picture? Oh, look at that dude. That's almost GQ. I mean, two years old, although I'm already making a fist. That's not too bad. But this picture didn't quite make it on the screen the way I wanted to. Because if it showed it all the way, I wanted, I mean, the, the adults would get this. But the kids, I wanted them to show how wealthy we were when I was growing up. Because if you pan that out on top of that stove, we had the most modern coffee maker known to man at that time. It was porcelain, and you set it on top of a burner, and it bubbled. 
It was a modern day coffee maker. It was cool. Wish you could have seen it. So, um, I am not going to start this talk at that age. I just need you to see how cute this dude is. I mean, come on. What are you going to do? I have no upper teeth, but okay. <sighs> Did you live with me? <laughs> so, okay. You don't have to look at that too much longer. You can, you can take that off the screen. So what I am going to do is I'm going to start at the age of between 14 and 15 when I was baptized. I was raised Southern Baptist. Um, pretty much the dangling over the pits of hell religion. But uh, like I said, I was born, or I was baptized then. Um, it didn't take long before what I considered hypocrisy to take over in the church. Now, I'm, I'm saying this because it's things that I saw, things that I felt. And it didn't take long before I started thinking, you know what? I'm going to start doing life on my terms because these are the people I was baptized and these are the people that tell me how I should be living, yet I see things that just didn't feel right to me. And at that age, I guess I was, thought I was smart enough to figure out life myself. I think it's appropriate to talk about baptism because of last Saturday. For you young ones that youngsters are young adults that got baptized. Do us a favor. Do yourself a favor. Um, do this community a favor. If you ever see something or feel something that doesn't feel right, talk to an adult. Don't start putting scenarios together in your head to maybe start you down the wrong path. Because what I'm going to talk about is way wrong. This is crazy. Wow. The disclaimer I have for you is don't try this at home. Don't do this on your own. Don't try doing things the way I did it. I'm going to tell you my story, all of you, for one purpose and one purpose only is I did it the wrong way. By the time I was 16, 17 years old, I came to the, came to the conclusion that I'm not going to be happy unless I do it my way. And I kind of figured out that I could do it my way through control, manipulation, which led to a huge anger issue in my life. Um, I knew that if I could intimidate somebody and control them that way, my life was better. If manipulation didn't work, I learned that violence worked really good. Because if somebody's afraid of you, they're either going to stay away from you or they're going to do what you want. So, I, my last two years of high school were pretty much that. Um, I am not proud of it, but I can honestly tell you I know what it's like to be bullied from the bully's standpoint. You know, it, it just seemed like an easy way. Um, my life seemed easy at that time because I was in control. After high school, um, I took a job that was probably suited the best for me. There was multiple bars in the area, and I took a job as a bouncer in a couple of really rough places, but I was in my element. Um, I was at the door. I was in control. I could manipulate situations, and if it got out of hand, I got paid to beat people up. It's kind of cool, and 
it was what I was doing. Um, after a, a while doing that, I had run into some guys. I'm going to fast forward through a lot of this because we're going to double back. But some guys from Chicago approached me and uh, kind of recruited me. Thought I would do good working for them downtown. Um, they told me what it was about. I went down one weekend to try to kind of find out what the situation was. And I thought, you know what? This is kind of cool. This is right down my alley. I don't have to change who I am. And there's a chance I could make some really good money. Um, I went to work for Bookies. My job was to recover and recoup money any way I could. Um, I did it for a few years. Um, the one embarrassing thing I can say is I got good at it. And the reason I was good at it is because I had no conscience. I had no empathy. I just had a desire to control. And then money came into it. It was about the money. My job was to go down on a Friday afternoon. And we would show up at a specific place and they would give us a list of names. That list of names would have one, their name, uh, but where they would hang out, how much was owed. And uh, so that was my job, Friday nights and Saturday nights. I'd go down, track these guys down. If they didn't have the money, I would make sure that they were afraid not to have the money next time. And if they had the money but didn't want to give it to me, that's when you put them into a submission point to where they would give it to you. You take your bag back, you get a cut out of it. I I enjoyed the hell out of it. Well, one night, we got down there. It was actually Saturday night. And I normally would work alone, sometimes with another guy. No big deal. But I got down, and I had one name on my list. Couldn't figure it out. He was one name, one amount, three or four places to check. When I went to leave, it was the different part about it was they sent two guys with me. Never done that before. Never had three of us. Didn't even know what was going on. I just thought, okay, just another night. Went into a pool hall down in the loop. To second, second or third place, we found them. Took him back to the one of the back rooms, and it didn't take long to get violent. Threw him on the floor. Threw him on the floor, basically. I climbed up and went to get on top of him. One of the guys handed me a loaded gun. Now I know why there was three of us. The guy must have been very violent. So 
So there I sit on his chest with a loaded gun against his head. Remember that moment. Needless to say, I knew that at that point I was either going to die or end up in prison. It really kind of affected me because I enjoyed this so much. I had no compassion up until this point in my life. But I put the gun on the table, and I walked out. I walked away, and I tried to live my life. Never went back to Chicago. To this day, people want to go to Chicago, and there's sometimes there's something inside of me don't go. Even in a we, matter of fact, I'll tell you a story. We had a Bible study group. And one of the individuals wanted to spend, wanted to go down to Chicago for the weekend as a group. And I did everything in my power to convince them not to, because I didn't want to be there. So I'm living my life at home. Like I say, I'm fast forwarding through a lot of this because I want to go back to it. And, uh, trying to live my life. I get married. Was it a great marriage? No. But I'm moving forward, I think. Thinking that I'm doing all the right things on my own. She gets killed in the head-on car collision. Man, my anger got to that. A few days later, I was even mad at the garbage men. What the hell are you doing picking up garbage? The world is supposed to come to an end. But yet, life goes on. I remember sitting one night in the living room in the dark. I don't know why. But I found myself crying out. Why the hell do I have to do this? What did I do to deserve this? A couple days later, I'm cleaning up some stuff, going through a storage closet. And a frame falls off the shelf. I pick it up and look at it. There's a Something somebody gave to me years back. Might have been even when I was in high school. I don't know, but it was something I had. And I looked at it. Some of you may know what this is. Some of you don't. But it was a framed uh, Christian poem type thing. I don't know how to describe it. But it was footprints in the sand. I thought about that for a few days because at this point in my life God was so far away that's because I walked away matter of fact I ran I mean I didn't even give him a second thought
So what are these talks all about? Real people, real Jesus. We're all real people. We're all broken. We all make mistakes. We all can be ashamed of something we've done in our life. We all need help. We've said it before, we're all train wrecks. Real Jesus. What does that mean? When I was asked to do this, I was asked to pick a time in my life when you really realized Jesus showed up for you. And I, I mean, I was asked to do it, and I thought, sure, no problem. Even though I've given my testimony many, many, many times, it still hits me to know that not only Jesus shows up, but even when you're at your worst, Jesus can use you. So let's t take my story. And let's see where Jesus showed up. Now, I freely admit, and I have talked to God about this many, many times, that it was my decision to walk away. It was my decision to take a path I shouldn't have taken. It was my decision to decide I'm in control of my life. But yet, at the moment that my life could have been completely ruined and turned upside down, the night I had that gun to that guy's head, there was something inside of me that said, I have a different path for you. The first real time I knew Jesus showed up. That night I walked away. You don't walk away from these people. You don't just leave and not pay a cost, a price. For the longest time, I would sit in my house in the dark in case somebody showed up. I wouldn't go anywhere, and there's some people that understand this, a lot of people think it's irrational. But for the longest time, I wouldn't go to a public outing or facility or bar or restaurant if I couldn't sit at the farthest back with my back to the wall. Because I needed to see the door. I needed to see who... I was living in fear. Second time Jesus showed up. Not once... Did anybody try to find me? Did anybody try to pull me back in? Never tried to exact some kind of re revenge? Totally protected me through all of that. My wife dies in a car accident, and I cry out. third time Jesus shows up shows me that I wasn't doing it alone when I thought I was walking the sands of that beach of myself he was carrying me I'm so far away from him right now yet he loves me enough to show me he cares Let's put that picture of that little guy back up. Hmm. I'm sure, not at this age, but close to this age, I started having those dreams of being a fireman, of being a policeman or an astronaut, 
You know, all the things those boys have at that young age. But when this guy grew up and got to high school, probably between sophomore and junior year, I had one dream. I, wasn't, I didn't want to play for an NFL football team. I didn't want to be a cop. I didn't want to be a fireman. The one thing that kept running through my head and my heart was I wanted a family. I wanted a wife that loved me. I wanted children. But I threw all that away by the time I was a senior. I had gone down a path that that wasn't going to happen. And in my heart, I was thinking, well, that's why she died. I went down a path. I didn't deserve it. There's consequences. Two years or so later, God remembered that dream that little kid had in high school. Thirty years later, thirty years ago, I should say, God decided to put somebody in my life. With kids. Took care of it all at one time. A wife that loves me, kids that love me, I can love back. <laughs> Jesus showed up huge. 30 years of marriage. Thank you, Jesus. Number four in my life that I can put a pin in. Real people, us. Real Jesus, always been there. I'm telling you right now, he's working in your life. You might not even know it. I went through a decade of him working in my life. I didn't even know it. Sometimes it just takes something to make you stop and think. But if everybody in this room stopped, reflected on their life, they could find a, a time when Jesus showed up big. And he's showing up big all the time. We just don't recognize it. Take the time. Take the time to see what Jesus is doing in your life. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to play a song. You don't have to sing with it. Words are going to be up there. But I want you to listen to it. I want you to pay attention to the words. Not everybody has tragedy in their life. I know people that lived up in the church and have had what seems like unimaginable great life. It's not possible without Jesus. Some of us have taken paths we never should have, and it could have been avoided so easily. But we get in the way. So pay attention to the words, meditate on it, and let it work in your heart. Thanks.